So why should you study in USA and especially in 2024 when there are so many other countries which are great options for you? I've made this video on almost every popular country out there and today I want to tell you the major reasons to study in US. We'll talk about the best locations in the US that you should be considering. We'll discuss the intake, what are the best courses to study, what kind of tuition fee you can expect to pay if you're going to the US, what kind of language tests you have to take, what is the application process if you have to apply by yourself, and what kind of a post-study work permit you get, and how do you move on to a green card from there. Everything that you need to know is mapped out. So let's start with number one, why should you study in the US? Well, simply because they have the best of the best universities in the world. Whenever you look at the top 10 universities in the world, top 10, top 20, top 50, you will see approximately 50 to 70% of these universities will belong to this one country called the US. On top of that, the education system in the US is globally recognized which makes it easier for you to essentially go anywhere in the world after you've studied in the US and people will still look at your resume and say yes this is the kind of candidate we want simply because they studied from this prestigious school in the US. The US does give you a pathway to PR however getting to that is difficult for some people than the other. It depends on the kind of degree you go for and I will detail that to, for you in this video as well. There's about a one to three year of a post-study work permit as well. That means after completion of your degree, you can either work for one year or three years. It depends on your degree and we'll discuss that as well, but you will have the opportunity to work in the US. And personally, for me, what I would say is that the US has really been the highest return on investment country. I've looked at a lot of countries, UK, Ireland, almost all the European countries, Australia, Canada, US. We send students every year, thousands of them, to all of these destinations. And the highest return on investment after you have done studying, you know, comes from the US. And we don't just take into account the salaries, it's also about the spending power, going to another country, let's say buying a house. Students have shown the best return on investment in the US. So these would be some of the biggest reasons to study there. Let's talk about the right locations though, because if you end up going to a bad location, let's say you're studying in Missouri, that really drastically decreases your chances of getting a decent return on investment. So some of the best locations that I would recommend most of you guys to focus on are places like California, which have universities like Stanford University, the pinnacle of education almost is right over there. Or you have places like New York, where they have amazing universities like Columbia University, New York University, it's really great and a lot of opportunities and employers as well. You have places like Boston, Massachusetts, amazing location. Universities like Harvard exist in this particular location. It's very costly, but has a good return on investment. It really depends on which exact degree you're going for, which field of study you're going for, then you wanna look at what kind of employers are available in that particular area, right? So if you're going for, let's say, computer science, you wanna stick to areas where there's a lot of CS employers. Let's talk about the best intakes if you want to study in the US. Number one would be the fall intake. Now the fall intake really starts in August or September. You basically fly out in one of these months if you're in the fall intake. This is the biggest intake that you will find in the US and the deadlines for this intake are usually around November or December max to max. The next biggest intake, the second biggest would be the spring intake where the education begins in January and that essentially means that the deadlines are in somewhere around August. And the final and the smallest intake is of the summer intake, where the education really begins in May for the most part. Like I said, this is the most limited intake. There's a very few schools, very few programs, and the deadlines are somewhere, you know, scattered between January through April of the same year. Next, let's talk about the best courses to study in the US. Now, of course, if you're going to any particular country, you should know what you're going to study there, right? And if this particular country does not support a program like yours, or you're not gonna get a job later on from this program, then you should look at other alternatives. So make sure that you focus on this part. The best courses to study in the US would be, number one, engineering. Amazing opportunities, a lot of them will be found there. Computer science, which is essentially a part of it, is going to be at the very top over there. Medicine programs like nursing, dentistry, they have a lot of scope in the US. There's programs where you are studying business analytics. So these kinds of programs are also where basically you'll see a lot of people getting jobs. Finally, the fields of data science and machine learning, AI, they have been rising. So this program is also 
quite important. And of course, the evergreen business field, US is always going to be amazing for business, so you can focus on that. Let's talk about the tuition fee you can expect to pay in the US. This depends, of course, on the level of study you are going for. A bachelor student can expect to pay somewhere between $15,000 to $45,000 per annum. Yes, education in the US can be much more costly as compared to most other countries, but the return is also just as good. Master's level candidates can expect to pay somewhere between $15,000 to $75,000 per annum. The highest of tuitions are usually for business programs where you're paying $70,000, $75,000 also and sometimes per annum. However, the least of tuitions can be for programs like engineering or social sciences where you're just paying in basically certain cases, you can even expect to pay somewhere close to just $20,000 per annum and that's usually a good mark, I would say, if you're going to study in the US. Below that, it's very difficult to find a decent college. And finally, if you're going for a PhD degree, you should not be paying for a PhD. A PhD, I always say, is not a PhD until you get it fully funded. In fact, you should get stipends and waivers and everything on top of it, all right? So PhDs are usually fully funded. Almost the worst of the profiles also that I've sent, they also get about 80 to 90% funding in PhDs. So no one really pays for it if you do it right. Remember that these fees and deadlines, they vary wildly based on the universities. So make sure that you check the tuition and deadlines consistently on wamgrad.com where you'll find all this information for free for almost every program that you're looking into. Now, if you want to study in the US, you have to usually take a language test. What are the accepted language tests for the US? Number one is the TOEFL. TOEFL is the best test to take if you are targeting the US. Number two, and this is also almost worldwide accepted, IELTS. I personally would stay away from PTE or, you know, I would not push myself towards a Duolingo if I'm going to the US for the most part because less and less universities accept that test right now. Both of these actually. Let's talk about the application process for universities in the US. The number one thing that you need to do, my friend, is to shortlist the right universities. If you shortlist the wrong universities, you're really in for a ride of your life where you're not gonna like it. Simply because either Best case scenario, you won't get admissions, right? Or you won't get scholarships. Worst case scenario is you end up going to a bad university or you get your visa rejected at the last stage. Both of these conditions are not going to be good. So make sure that you shortlist them correctly. Don't go for tier three, tier two universities that counselors out there will be suggesting. If you need help with selecting genuine universities, you can take a look at the Rate My Chances tool on viamgrad.com or you can connect with me on my WhatsApp number, which is given to you below. After you shortlist the right universities, you need to make sure that you're meeting the minimum requirements for admission in these universities. What does that mean? That means, for instance, you need to have the minimum required language test score, whether it's TOEFL or else, you need to be able to show them that you have the minimum required score to be able to get into the program. In certain cases, you may have to take standardized tests, although most of these can be waived since the age of COVID, but you always have the availability of tests like GRE, GMAT, SAT, ACT. Different people have to take different tests. You may need to take one of these tests or you have to apply to the university which are waving it off. And you also have to make your SOP without software such as ChatGPT. Make sure that you make authentic SOPs. You tell, the, tell them your story really, you know, the essays. That's what I'm talking about here. Your personal essays, your personal statements your statements of purpose, they tell the committee more than your grades, who you really are on paper and you know, who, who you really are as a person apart from your grades, all right? And that's something that can only be beautifully crafted if you write it in your language as a human. You also have an online application where you have to submit short answer questions, details like your passport number, previous employment statistics and whatever you have basically, all of that information go in as well. You may have sometimes interviews with professors in certain cases. And finally, you have to pay the application fee. If you are working with us, we do everything for you, even train you for interviews. In many cases, we waive your application fee as well. So again, if you're interested in connecting with me, you can chat with me on my WhatsApp directly. Let's finally talk about the post-study work permit. What happens after completion of your degree when you really want to avail the benefits of your program, right? This is what you came for. This is what you paid all this for, studied all this, and you know, got through the program. So after your studies are complete, you get something called as the OPT, which really stands for Optional Practical Training. Now, OPT can be different for different programs. Here comes the concept of STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, or math. If your program has the STEM attribute enabled, that means your program is STEM enabled, you will get 
three years to work in the US without any other requirement of an H-1B or any, any other visa type. So three years for STEM enabled degrees. Remember, STEM enabled degrees don't always have to be engineering. There may be finance programs that are STEM enabled. Medical programs are STEM, STEM enabled, right? There may be business programs that are STEM, STEM enabled. So again, you have to just find those programs really. And non-STEM programs, that is other programs, they get one year after their degree is complete to basically work in the US. Now, OPT doesn't have to be the end of your stay in the US. Every single year that you get as an OPT, your employer can actually file for an H-1B for you. Now, of course, H-1B is a lottery based process. So if you are lucky enough to get that H-1B, which most people are in the first go, second go, max to max the third go, you will be able to stay for three more years and then you can extend your H-1B further. And finally, there's a process through which later on you can even apply for a green card. But let's not make this video too long. That's everything you need to know about studying in the US and whether you should consider it as your next home. If you have questions, you can reach out to me. My WhatsApp number is still in the description. You can do that. Or you can connect with me on Instagram as well, where a lot more information and content like this is available. So I'd be happy to connect with you there as well. Thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye and take care for now.